The Nintendo Entertainment System, or as it was called back in the day, Nintendo. The console that will always be in our hearts. Question is, will it always be in our rotation of games to play? And what about the kids who might not have any nostalgia for it? Would somebody think about the kids? Well, I did. And if parents are doing their job and following my guide to parenting, maybe they will have nostalgia for it. Here's the thing. As iconic as the NES is, it's hard to imagine that a day would ever come where people stopped talking about it. But there's a big difference between talking about something and wanting to have anything to do with it. Just ask my creepy Uncle Al. I've always thought the NES would age into more of a fun grandpa type. Has some wacky ideas, perhaps a bit rough around the edges due to age, but above all else, does not care what others think. After all, the NES's game library is known for its I don't care if you think I'm too challenging difficulty that is toppled many a once proud gamers. I'll never forget what Ninja Gaiden did to me the first time I played it. So naturally, not everyone who goes to play NES games for the first time is going to have patience for their difficulty. That being said, it's likely going to be those of us who have been playing these games for a while now, for example, an entire lifetime, who will be leading the charge for which games continue to be talked about the most and therefore, in all likelihood, played the most. When people look to try out classic Nintendo for the first time, there's a good chance they'll be looking to some of us for guidance. So folks, we gotta be ready. I always keep an eye out for anybody who gives off I might like playing Nintendo vibes, and when I spot a candidate, I pounce on them smoothly and swiftly. But if we're not recommending the right games, it could be a swing and a miss, which would be sad. Recommend a Bayou Billy and you might have just destroyed one potential NES fan. And that's another thing. It's not just about difficulty. Some games are considered difficult, but still good, like a Castlevania, while other games are considered difficult and bad, like a Bayou Billy. My apologies to any fans of Bayou Billy, but you're probably used to the fact not everybody likes it by now. Okay. So I've been talking a lot about what will get newcomers on board with the NES in the years to come, but that's not to dismiss those of us who have already been playing its games for years. And believe me, I understand that some of us may feel like if you ever enjoyed an NES game, then you will always enjoy it. That's how I generally feel about games. Even for some of the more notorious examples of video games that people say aged badly, like Goldeneye, I can still have a blast playing this game. But the reality is that there are some people who feel like certain games haven't aged well, and those tend to be the same games that aren't recommended for beginners. I mean, a game that has been called the NES's greatest game many times, The Legend of Zelda, gets criticized for being a game that hasn't aged well all the time, as much as some people may strongly disagree. But I tell ya, trying to get my friends' kids who really love Breath of the Wild to play the original Zelda on NES just ain't happening, and believe me, I've tried things to encourage it. So with all of this in mind, the games I'm going to be recommending are games that are not, I repeat, are not, one more time, are not the only games I think are good games for the system. These are just five games that I feel especially confident that I could fire up for years and years to come that would stand a good chance of being enjoyed by fans and first timers alike of the Nintendo Entertainment System. So, with that said, the first game on my list is Punch-Out, either the Mike Tyson version or the Mr. Dream version. Does anybody prefer the Mr. Dream version? Either way, this is a game that is not only considered one of the best games for the console, but also pretty darn memorable and iconic if you ask me. I mean, Mike Tyson himself will live on in the lore of celebrities, celebrity athletes, you name it, on and on and on. So, the fact he had a video video game that was actually pretty good is really going to allow this game to endure. Evander Holyfield's real deal boxing just doesn't bring the mustard in quite the same way, does it? The game also has a nice policy when it comes to difficulty too. Being, yeah, we'll kick your butt, but not until we've let you warm up and build up some confidence first. Not to mention, have some good solid fun, then we'll crush ya. 
Glass Joe, your first opponent, pretty much just lets you punch him. As long as you're aggressive, you'll win for sure. Definitely not a strategy that works in every NES game. But the farther you get into the game, the more you'll have to master good strategies and reflexes. What's cool about this game is how many different ways there are to beat each opponent. With all sorts of different little quirks and techniques players have discovered over the years, the game has a lot of depth. For example, did you know that if you successfully counter Bald Bull's charge attack, you can spot Luigi cheering in the crowd? Well, you didn't know that because I lied. But crazier things have happened in this game, making it a great game for the long haul. And as for the different stereotypes of the various boxers that the game has been called out for, well, hey, might warrant some you can't say that grandpa responses. And look at that, it's even missing teeth like a grandpa. Next game on my list is a bit of a curveball, The Adventures of Lolo, a game that not everybody knows, but most fans of the console have at least heard of it. What you have here is sort of a puzzle game in a way, but before hearing the word puzzle has you abandoning this video, seeing as some people don't find them very exciting, this game isn't a traditional puzzle game, such as something like Tetris. In this game, you are Lolo, trying to rescue Princess Lala. And that's right, because Lolo loves Lala, and Lala loves Lolo. So, now that I can assume you're motivated as all heck to get them back together, what do you need to do to make it happen, you may be wondering? Well, you're trying to collect all the hearts on screen, which allows you to open up a chest that contains a gem that allows you to open the door to the exit, just like in real life. You have a variety of tools at your disposal, as well as various elements you'll need to manipulate to solve each screen. And like Punch-Out, it starts out easy enough to get into, while providing more than enough challenge for those who want it, the further you go into the game. With so many games on the NES requiring masterful twitch reflexes, I like bringing up at least one game that doesn't. Not that there aren't times where sharp twitch reflexes won't help you out, but a lot of this game is about using your brain. Wait a second, trying to get me to use my brain? What kind of dirty trick is that? Well, yeah, it's not how everyone likes their games. Next game on the list, we have Contra. How could we not? Well, I guess by just not. But again, with this game, we have a way to help mitigate the difficulty with a little old trick called not playing it and just saying it's too stupid hard. Wait, hold on a second. That's not the one. Ah, yes, the Konami code. For beginners, when three lives isn't enough, 30 lives probably still isn't enough, but it does provide a much thicker cushion and is what makes me more likely to recommend this game for beginners over some of the other Contra games. One of the problems that a lot of NES games will present for beginners is that the first stage is almost just as difficult as the later stages and while Contra certainly veers more towards that than either of the first two games I've mentioned so far, it does give a little bit more leeway than some of the worst offenders. Yeah, old Billy's been getting hammered in this video. That said, for those who haven't played the first stage of Contra a thousand times like some of us have, it can be difficult. But besides the Konami code that will score you 30 lives, you can also play this game with a friend, possibly somebody really good at the game who recommended the game to begin with. So while your newcomer friend is burning through lives like hot butter, you can show him how it's done with all your fancy timed jumps and shooting. Plus, once you get a hang of this game at all, it can become very addictive, considered one of the best and most replayable NES games for a reason. Oh, and while we're at it, might as well throw Super C in there too. A great game for pretty much all the same reasons. Next game on the list is Mega Man 2. Again, considered one of the best games on the console, and while we're at it, you could throw in some of the other Mega Man games on the system too. And hey, throw in a banana as well, why not? I'd say this game's difficulty is maybe a notch below some of the harder NES games, while still providing plenty of challenge for those who want it, especially in the later stages. But whether it's a newcomer or a veteran, what makes the game highly accessible 
enjoyable, not to mention fun, is the ability to tackle the stages in whatever order you please. I mean, just check out me doing the quick man stage here first like a fool. But if you want to go an easier route, you make sure to get Metal Man's Saw Blades weapon, which some would say is overpowered, some would say is fun, and some would say is both and who cares. Next up, we have one of the more recognizable games on the system, Duck Hunt. I mean, why not recommend the game that got so many people into liking the system back in the day, as the one that could also do it moving into the future? Plus, even if you've played the heck out of this game, which a lot of longtime players have, it's always fun to go back for a quick few rounds, even if it's not a game you would marathon for 40 hours straight. Geez, imagine the condition you'd be in if you did that for this game. But Duck Hunt is novel and easy to play. You just aim the zapper, blast the ducks, and then get pissed off at the dog for laughing at you. Take out years of pent-up childhood aggression by beating the heck out of them in Super Smash Brothers and then hop right back to it. The only potential sticking point is the technology required for playing it, of which the most common solution is a CRT TV, aka big old tube TVs. Something not everyone has nowadays, let alone 30 years from now or goodness knows how long. But I'm hopeful there will be plenty of solutions for non-CRT displays by then that will allow a zapper to work, seeing as there already are at least some. I'm hoping for a lot of things for 30 years from now. People keep telling me the existence of nanners is in trouble, which is why I've been stocking up and steadily building a horde, much like Donkey Kong. All right. Now, before I finish my list, real quick, as obvious as it is, better mention the Mario games, and what I'm curious about is if more people will end up playing the All-Stars versions instead? Eh, probably a mix of both like they always have. But that does it for my list, and like I said, these are certainly not the only games I think are good games on the console. And while I catered my list towards both those who would be playing for the first time, as well as longtime fans, it's fair to say that there are plenty of more challenging games that are great games in spite of the challenge for those who are looking for games that put up a good fight. But in any case, I'd love to hear some of your arguments for why you think particular NES games stand a good chance of being loved for years and years to come. I tend to get inspired by your choices and answers, so I'm looking forward to it. So with that, leave your answer down below and I will see ya in the next video. He's the red bird, yeah. And he's talking, talking about video games. He's the